Hi folks, welcome to Tuesday's I Write Radio podcast. We're going to go with the uh, presser today. Uh, I've got Stuart Lockhead with me today who has an in into the education, sorry, the exams system. I do. Um, and he's going to give us a quick press say of that. Uh, Jimmy wants to have a wee chat about the new Tory leadership. Well, it's not decided yet, really, is it? Douglas Ross uh, is apparently still to be elected, but he's acting as though he's top. Well, player. it certainly looks like, I don't think anybody's going to stand against him, mate. So if that being the case, he will be named leader tomorrow. Cool. Um, so that's the general direction. There might be, as ever, a few paths that lead off in different directions. Um, let's start with a presser. Not really a surprise today that at least 50%, if not 75%, of the questions were about the uh, exam results. Stuart, you, uh, you've you got some, I think, relevant information about the SQ, was it SQE? SQA, SQA. SQA. Yeah, they've got a building out at uh, ESC, something or other, halfway to uh, Mill Keith. Estill. It's, it's a new place, that's why I can't, don't know the name. Um, yes, I had a phone call from uh, a, a, an angry former, an insider from the SQA. Um, what was said, right, um, angry about the lack of respect from the journalists. They don't seem to understand the professionalism of the SQA staff who are, uh, I think they're nearly all teachers. Uh, they, there is a three level system inside the SQA. So first of all, uh, each child's uh, results are run through whatever system they have, I don't know. Uh, and a, a grade is given and then that's reviewed and then it's reviewed again. It's all within the SQA before they're announced. And also at the moment, this year's estimates are based on exams and coursework, but not based on exams that the kids all sat before lockdown in December and January. Prelims. The prelims, as they're called in Scotland, mocks if you're in England, because they have to use a different term. She, uh, th th this person was also um, a bit exercised about the lack of respect that uh, generally people in teacher, the teaching profession in Scotland have about uh, their exam authority. The SQA is the only examination board in Scot Scotland. Whereas in England, apparently, they have uh, countless Humpty Dumpty exam boards. Is that a quote? <laughs> that's a quote. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about the, the size of it. But uh, uh, yes, there was a, I had a phone call uh, halfway through the presser. I suppose the question that I always ask myself at this time of year because it happens every year exam time why is the scottish government put under so much pressure on this issue when you never hear the westminster government being put under pressure on it jimmy can answer that one i know <laughs> it's pretty simple mate it's political the scottish government have to be held to account for everything because the smp are pushing for independence and every other, every part of the media, well, 99.9% .9 of the media is opposed to that independence. So they take any opportunity and let's be clear, exam results shouldn't be seen as an opportunity, but they take any opportunity to weaponize anything and use it as a stick to beat the SNP. They are not going to hold Westminster to account over educational attainment for children. That's way too big a stick. If they start waving that at Westminster, they're in all kinds of bother, but they can, they, they're entitled to wave it because they've got the support of their owners, they've got the support of their readers to do that up here. There is a, a contrast between England and Scotland on that basis. In England, the curriculum is decided from London. Every school in, in England has to follow the national curriculum or whatever it's called. In Scotland, it, it isn't laid down anything like as strictly. Teach, you know, schools do have quite a lot of leeway. 
I'm uh, not so sure about that over the last few years, but um, I, I would say it's, I mean, this was entirely predictable. We spoke about it last week. We spoke about it yesterday. It was entirely predictable that this was going to happen, that um, whatever the SQA decided wasn't going to satisfy the vultures in the Scottish media. Had oh, they, well, Nicola Sturgeon made it clear in the press of herself, you know, what we've seen is three quarters of all results not being altered at all. So 75% of the results were as the teachers recommended. The other 25%, they've downgraded some of them. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest Quite sensibly. Quite a lot yeah, of them. Quite a lot yeah, of them. Yeah, surprise me. Come on, you've got teachers. Let's not forget that teachers... Um, have to jump through hoops to justify their job every couple of years. You know, human nature is bound to have kicked in and some teachers would have been a bit lenient on their pupils. Probably because they like them, they work with them day in and day out. That's the kind of thing that the SQA has to look out for and alter exam marks accordingly. It's why the system's in place, because human nature would dictate teachers want to make themselves look good, their pupils look good, and their employer, the school, look good. So the SQA are looking out for that. And if the coursework and the prelim marks didn't quite match up to what the teachers had predicted these kids are going to get, they've marked it down. That, at the end of the day, is the SQA's job. And as Stuart said, we're talking about professional educators. And you didn't get a job at the SQA unless you're damn good at what you're doing. Uh, the other thing that struck me was this is a, this moderation, this so-called new level, um, which looked at the 25% of results, is surely just an expansion of what they do when you appeal a result. Exactly, exactly. These people are experienced in doing just that when appeals come through every year. I mean, and the, 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 there is the question of credibility. Uh, can I, shall I read out this? And suddenly, I'll just read out what the results are, the three main results that matter. Pass rate in National 5, up 2.9%. Hires, up 4.2%. And advanced hire, up 5.5%. Now, these are, generally speaking, higher than, than, a, than, tip, than a typical year in the last few years. But normally, they go up and down. Well, they were down last year on the previous so, year. I remember at that. The, at the end of the day, these qualifications that kids go off to you know then to the world of work with have to be credible they do uh, and they yeah. absolutely have to be credible Stuart and they also have to be measured against what's coming out next month or oh, sorry later in the month when the A-level results come out down in England and will we and see the Scotland. same furore over what comes out in England in three weeks as to what we've seen this morning I very much doubt it I mean what we've seen basically is a two-pronged attack, because the Liberal Demos are, Democrats haven't quite joined in yet. We've got a two-pronged attack by the Tories and Scottish Labour based on the work of a guy who, frankly, I don't know a great deal about, but he's working at Glasgow University um, doing stats about Scottish education. Well, congratulations, mate, you've got yourself a job for life there. But let's be clear, statistical analysis on anything can be designed or can be manipulated to say anything you bloody well like. So you've got this two-pronged attack. And I've also seen Ross Greer sitting begging for teachers who aren't happy with what awards their pupils have got today to get in touch with him on Twitter. So we're going to have a 26-year-old who is going to question the professionalism of people working at the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Frankly, I think somebody should slap Ross Greer down before he does that. Well, the other, the other statistic that could be controversial, I haven't actually heard anybody say anything about it yet, the attainment gap between the most and the least disadvantaged young people. It's narrower mm. now for na national fi fives, higher and advanced higher than for 2019. And on average, it's the same as the last four years. So according to this, this looks good for the, obviously for the Scottish government uh, as they've narrowed the attainment gap this year and it's stayed in its, and it's, a typic, it's typical for the last four years. Yeah, well, great. I mean, 
Well, what, no, but that again, even that, that will be used as a stick to beat the government. People mm -hmm. will say, hold it. You didn't do a real analysis of what the people's done. You took a look at what the attainment gap's been for the last couple of years and you worked towards getting the result that the attainment gap stayed the same. So that'll be the accusation. Oh. Well, what I find interesting was the 90% of the questions on this subject in the press were about, um, was it fair with the extra layer of moderation, the 25% of passes being looked at by this layer of moderation? And then the Telegraph came in and went, wait a minute, these results are better than last year. Can we trust these results to have been better than last year? Mm -hmm. Thereby totally underlining the point that Sturgeon had made about four times that mm -hmm. had we not gone through a process of moderation, you would have been criticised at criticising us oh, for that. She was delighted to say, this is my point completely. She has yeah, it. absolutely. Um, as I say, mate, it's, it's, I think what people are losing, and particularly the reporters, because there were a couple of them that actually just read verbatim this guy Barry Black's stuff that he'd fed to the Tories and Labour Party. So I would venture to suggest that they're too stupid to actually understand what Mr. Black was saying if they've just got to read it out as part of the question. But um, what they're all forgetting here is they're disparaging the work of all of these pupils. They're basically rubbishing the results of the entire group of people that didn't sit exams this year. And they're rubbishing those results to try and make a political point against the party of government in Scotland. Quite, it's quite offensive when you look at it like that. They're basically saying, ah, they kids didn't get the results. You've gerrymandered it. You've fixed it to make yourselves look good. Uh, it's, pretty, Jimmy, it's, it's pretty disdainful towards the entire block of pupils that have got exam results or non-exam results this morning. Jimmy, as a, a Labour Liberal Democrat, Tory SNP, I would like to say before I criticise you, that um, I really think you've done well and it's fantastic all this hard work has finally come to fruition and you're much stupider than your exam results say you are. Aye, aye. That's kind of what they've come out with, mate. It's a bit... It's kind of depressing in a way that um, the constitutional politics, that the knockabout that we have all the time in Scotland because we need this constitutional question answered. But it's it's a bit disgusting that reporters didn't take a wee step back and go, exactly how are we treating these 16, 17 and 18 year old kids by using them and using their results today as a stick to beat the government? Oh, well, that, that, that is, I would say, that's a point. I mean, when did we first start studying, uh, criticising first minister's questions? Ever since then, that was 2007, 13 mm -hmm. years. And we've always said it's, it's easy to uh, attack the National Health Service because there's always will be holes in it. It's mm. never going to be perfect. And it's mm. easy to attack the educational system as well because it's very bloody complicated. And you yeah. can always find bits and pieces that you can pick up and say, oh, this is going badly wrong. Whereas when you sit down and look at it, the outcomes for children leaving a Scottish school compared to an English school you're far more likely to go into what they call it, university. A positive outcome, yeah. Yes, a positive outcome. A university, a higher education, or a, these days. Or a job. A but, a but, or an apprenticeship. A but, 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 There's no a cherry on top. Aye, well, there, there, there could be a cherry on top one day, mate, but let's not talk about that the day. <laughs> um, I noticed that uh, the mad history woman has been looking for stories from people who worked in areas that are devolved to the Scottish government. Yes. Um, and I couldn't help but think that uh, Douglas Ross had been on the phone to her, begging her well, to dig up some dirt. It's I, interesting that she's got a nice big fat tranche of funding to launch or to get involved with the majority on Facebook and Twitter to um, wow. push the fact that the silent majority are fighting back. It's also interesting that she seems to be absolutely, she's got her legs wrapped around, oh no, maybe I shouldn't have used that. Ah, hell. She's got her legs wrapped around the back of George Galloway and his wee um, 
idiot group Alliance for Unity as well. They are so tight. It's unbelievable. I would imagine that the checks were written in the same office right enough in Ochter Mukti, but am I, just, <laughs> am I just maybe getting a wee bit too much of the tinfoil bonnet pre-Friday, guys? Uh, I hope you take this the right way, Jimmy. You're not trying to cook up a story, are you? No, no, possibly. I just think it's interesting that the professionalism of both those groups and the genuinely, mate, their, their um, cyber content is outstanding. Their graphic content is superb. They've spent a lot of money, Alliance for Unity and the majority, and they launched within a few weeks of each other and they look awfully, awfully professional and awfully similar. Mm. Um, you, you wanted to talk about uh, Dougie Ross. Yeah. Ducky um, Ross, mate, that I, there was, there was a, a tweet that the SNP in, and I don't know if it was inadvisable, actually. I think it's possibly more inadvisable that they've since deleted it, but they put a tweet about Dougie Ross yesterday, and one of the points said that he had a long history of racism. As I say, it's since been deleted, and the Tories are kicking up a stink about it. Um, they seem, the Tory angle seems to be Douglas Ross apologised for his crass racist remarks about gypsies so he shouldn't be held to account for it he apologized so it doesn't matter but it led, led me to start thinking about where we were discussing yesterday you know the so dream if, team oh, him, wait a minute does that mean if the snp apologize for calling the racist bastard a racist it doesn't matter i would imagine that seems that's certainly what murdo the turdo is um, inferring as I say, I thought it was probably inadvisable to delete. I would have left it out there because, um, as far as I'm concerned, his remarks were racist and he should be held to account for them. I found it straight away on the main SNP website. Mm -hmm. Still but, there, but, look for it. What, I was, what I was getting to was yesterday when we were talking about the dream team, him and Ruth, and Michael Gove's apparently going to be the puppet master that helps them with their campaign. But... Um, Ruth and Douglas both have previous for bullying people in school <laughs> that they studiously ignore and absolutely will answer no questions upon it. So it just strikes me that these are these kind of people. Um, I don't know if this is a campaign the SNP should run. I'm thinking this is a campaign that the Yes Movement should run alongside the SNP, who absolutely can take these folk apart on policy and on government. But I think we should run a campaign of ridicule. I think we, as the Yes Movement, should absolutely rip the hole out of them every time they open their mouth for the next 10 months, right up to the election. Nori, you're a cartoonist. There's plenty of great cartoonists out there. Let's have portray these pair as Laurel and Hardy, Pinky in the Brain. Let's laugh at them at all opportunities, because both of them, open their mouths and let their belly rumble and come out with some. Well, look, he, he doesn't need to do a new one for, for Ruth, Ruth the Muthy. I just came across an old one. Aye, I mean, we've already uh, seen... Uh, we've already seen her in her uh, Gestapo outfit. Well, the oh, Jack Boots and the Nappy. Uh, the Jack Boots and the Nappy, that's the one. But, I mean, we've already seen Douglas Ross lie with impunity about telling us that Nicola Sturgeon had signed up to some document that meant that there couldn't possibly be an Indian F2. So if he's willing to lie, we should be willing to call out that lie and do it in a funny manner. As I say, Carter, Nori, you talked the other day about when the, La the Labour team in 2014 turned up and that boy turned up and just gave them the old Imperial March, Dan, Dan, Dan. The ridicule was brilliant. The amount of coverage that that got was superb. Yeah, And I think yeah. we should be willing to absolute. I mean, as I say, the SNP can point to their, their idiocy on policy because they didn't have policy. They're going to argue, or it would appear they're going to argue that Scotland is too stupid to run itself and run its own affairs. But I would love to see a campaign of ridicule for these two. Absolutely tear into well, them. I mean, this, spit an image puppet, it's a whole lot. Douglas Ross lie about um, the Edinburgh Agreement containing some nonsense about a lifetime or a generation. That's not the first time he's come out with that. He's come out no, with no, that that's, before. And that, that's Boris's line. That's Boris's line about 
telling us that we can't have one because well specifically we... douglas ross i, I mm -hmm. remember about maybe 18 months ago he came out with it on something like question time or something like that it was on telly well, and, how, do, how do we deal with it we, we we complain all the time about this it's you call him a liar you call him a liar aye because if we call him a liar instead of saying that he's wrong or blah 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 you call him a liar and you call him a liar on the six o'clock news you absolutely call him out and say and then, that's a lie and he knows it's a lie because he's been told it's a lie before and he's repeating it so that makes him a repeat liar so we're going to need uh people that will get on the six o'clock news uh, to, in other words, that would be listened to by the BBC. Well, next yeah. time somebody from the BBC wants to interview you at a demo show, you start with the line, you do know Douglas Ross is a liar. <laughs> All right, at that point, the BBC ears prick up and they think, hold it, this is a guy we should maybe be listening. No, no, no so much listening to is, oh, this is going to be interesting. Because yeah. let's be honest, when they're out in the street, they're only looking for Vox Pops. They're not looking for any real interest. But every single one of them that's out there looking for a Vox Pop that has a microphone in their hand and a camera, they all consider themselves worthy of a Pulitzer Prize. They all fancy their chances of finding a story. So give them a story. Mm. You do know that the leader of the opposition in Scotland is an abject liar. You do know he's racist. We, we need to, well, can we do it? I don't know. What I'd like to see is him manipulated into a position where he has to either deny that he's a liar and then be asked to prove it in which case he would have to prove he was a liar or hmm. an apology that can Aye. be repeat, repeated ad infinitum he's not going to get that is, apology it'd always be a i'd be sorry if people took it badly or something like that well, well as i say that, as well mate you, you point matter. to the point to the strings point to the strings the only reason he's been picked He's been crowned leader in Scotland. It's basically because he's going to do exactly everything that he's told by London. Because they're going to run this campaign. And you, you also point to the strings and you ask the questions. Ruth, for example, absolutely everything that comes out of Ruth's mouth over the next 10 months, you just question, why are you fighting this campaign, Ruth? It's nothing to do with you. You're pissed off to London to take 350 odd quid a day and put yeah. the, the, the deed stock coat on. Why should we listen to anything you say when none of, this, none of the decisions you're asking us to make are going to affect you, your partner, or your child? I, th I think we need to start referring to Ruth as Colonel Milady. Ah, that's not a bad one, eh? And I'd love to see Nicola Sturgeon stand up at uh, FMQs and answer one of her questions by doffing her cap, tugging her forelock, and referring to her as Milady. Milady, the leader of the opposition. Baroness Disaster Zone. Mm. Yes, Milady, in a wee Parker voice. I like that one, Nori. Uh, do we know what she's going to be Baroness of? Baroness uh, of the tank. She's not announced it yet, mate. Not Baroness Buffalo Rider or whatever. Uh, well, it could be Ochtar Machty. It's not that far from Buckhaven to Ochtar Machty. Uh, that's very true. The Baroness of Bucky. <laughs> uh, 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 Bucky, eh, uh, Bucky. Bucky with a CH, rather uh, than uh, Bucky uh, with a CK. Uh. The Baroness of Bucky. Oh, Bucky, we are. Somewhere that sounds nice, like West Weems or somewhere. Uh, Bucky, we are. Nice, yeah, big more likely. green uh, bottle and a yellow label. Uh, because there is a, 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 a an Earl of Weems or something like that, isn't there? Well, she'll not allow it to be Weems then. Yeah, well, she could be the Baroness of Weem, East Weems or something. Yeah. No, I like the Baroness of Bucky. I thought that rather. Uh, and her and the history woman can go out and test the Bucky. The liquid I'd Bucky. Imagine, I'd imagine that, that um, Ruth, has have she ever drunk Bucky in the past? Will never do so again now that she's been a noble. She'll be on the finest of claret at all times. I would imagine Ruth has had a swig of Bucky, actually. She strikes me as the, her, her tomboy past, I think, would have... Well, if, mate, if she was a school bully, she must have been in the back of the bike shed with a fag hanging out her mouth and a half bottle of Bucky in her back pocket. Eh? Oh, that's a lovely picture. <laughs> I forgot you get Bucky in, in, in half bottles. Right, back to the point. Um, so I think what we're saying...
between History Woman's appeal for stories and Mr. Ross's willingness to tell porkies on national television is the start of the campaign. Yep, I agree. 2021. The campaign, the campaign has started now. Like Angus Robertson, they're getting their campaigning in early. That's true. Uh, I, I, I always know. worry when the Tories go early because I don't think they've got the strength and depth to maintain it. Um, can I just... You're forgetting, you're you're forgetting how arrogant they are, mate. You're forgetting just how arrogant they are. And this campaign is going to be run by the team that got Boris's 80 majority and that won um, the Brexit campaign. So you're forgetting just how arrogant they are and... We're up against it. <clears throat> Stuart, you were going to say. I just say there was, but some, uh, there was a little surprise in the presser that uh, you, you may have noticed, or maybe not. Apparently, they use information, some of the information, the, the surveillance testing information that they use at the moment um, is calculated on a UK wide basis. London School of something in tropical medicine. It would appear that the Scottish government are not satisfied with the information they're getting. From this London. is this is the modelling. So they commissioned their own survey, and they are now looking for three thousand Scottish volunteers for this new survey. Sorry, guys, I've got phone going. I'll be back in a sec. Um, yeah, I noticed that, um, and I think it's a good move because I think I genuinely think she's trying to put pressure on the four nations to go for the eradication approach. Well, that was the other, the other item I, I wanted to bring up, so I'm glad you brought it up. She, he, he was asked about that, and uh, she, look, you're right, uh, she has made it clear that uh, the word thing they've suggested, they've had a meeting about the UK, the UK four, the four governments, and uh, the Scottish government have put forward a wording that they want this, all the other governments to agree to. They're really talking about pressurising London, of course. And it's about elimination. It's going for an yeah. elimination policy. That's what it's about. And as you say, the pressure is being put on. She's put on the pressure on London. Um, and it will be interesting to see what comes out of that meeting. Um, but I do, I do think this idea of having our own modelling is as much about pressure on London mm. as it is. Although, and... I mean, it's got to be useful if it's accurate, of course. Well, look, you think about it when the, uh, at the start of the epidemic, uh, SAGE, this UK-wide body, which was uh, informing the, the, the UK government, was bait. They, they were using it in Scotland as well, but it didn't take them long to decide it wasn't good enough. And they, she set up her own body. And guess who was on it? Debbie Sridhar, who's now... Yeah. The star of the pandemic. <laughs> Who's blocked Murdo Fraser and Alec Cole Hamilton from her Twitter line. We've no. <laughs> been trolls. Eh? Very good. Very good. That's a good one. Murdo okay, is I, complaining. Is he chair of some health committee? Uh, he's chair of the COVID committee at Holyrood, mate. But uh, Murdo should be very well aware of what horse he's ass he makes himself on a regular basis on Twitter. So you'll forgive me if... Uh, respected scientist doesn't want to listen to said horses but I didn't mind her block. I think it's quite entertaining that she's blocked them. And Alex Cole Hamilton, yeah, forgive me again mate, but nobody takes that wee nyaf seriously since he got captured telling porky pies. He's as well just gean up that game and getting himself back in the second hand cars with Jackson. Oh was he I thought he was a postman, Cole Hamilton. Nah he wasn't a second hand car salesman mate, but he always struck me as somebody that looks exactly how a second hand car salesman should like should look like. He's very good at posting out campaign literature anyway. Um, Stuart, you had something you thought might round things up for us? Yes. Um, there's an MP, an SNP MP called Richard Thompson. Are you, had you heard about him before yesterday? Yeah, he's asked questions at FMQs, yeah. Or PMQs, you mean? I'm talking about an SNP. Oh, right. Sorry, wrong he Thompson. Uh, uh, Stuart, where are, we going? where are we going with this? I know the boy. Oh, you do? Richard Thompson. Okay, well, let me just... I don't have much to say except that he seems to have been wheeled out as a loyalist to write a very inane, bland um, 
thousand words just saying that uh, why are some uh, Scottish independence is close, so why are some supporters acting like it isn't? And he says at the end, May's election will be the, the moment when independence supporters can make Indie Ref an unstoppable reality. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry, you called him a loyalist. That kind of, I was, my head was not thinking Nicholas Sturgeon uh, loyalist. I was uh, you, were, you, were, you were thinking the lamb big and... Exactly. No, no, exactly. No, I'm talking about he's an SMP uh, loyalist. He's an he's an MP and he's a loyalist MP and he's obviously been wheeled out to write something. I think they probably gave him the script and just put his name on it. I wouldn't well, disparage the man, mate. He's smarter than a box of frogs. I, I mean, I I am kind of on the fence on this one, guys. Perhaps even not quite on the fence yet. I don't understand what the big hoo-ha really is about this. This is the most successful political party in the British Isles. It's that he's simple. A, you know. you'll, you'll, be, you'll be getting the next job. You'll get, be asked, they'll be phoning well, you and asking for the next paper. Sure, for... the facts speak for themselves. We this is the most that. successful political party in terms of elections, etc., in the British Isles. Nobody's Who's more right? successful? Yeah, they're successful in, in, in all these fact ways, but they're not successful in gaining Scotland's independence. So, yeah, yet Stuart, we've had this discussion before. Yet, do you really think they can just click their fingers and hold a uh, hold a referendum next week? How dare you say something stupid like that? Of course not. Well, well, what I mean, are you shouting and bumping your gums about, mate? They've got the process they've got to go through. If, as a sitting MP. Richard Thompson is bound to say what the party line is, which is basically give us over 50% in both votes next year and we will deliver independence. That's what's going to be, well, that may not be what's in their manifesto, but that's certainly the party line and has been the party line for a long time. Well, well exactly. And how many, man yeah. how many mandates have they had? I'm sick of hearing this, how many mandates. What does it matter? How, can you tell me where they could have put a bloody referendum for Scottish independence into the last five years, okay. given that we've had three are general we, elections and the Brexit campaign? Are we going to rerun this entire argument now at the end of the show? No, but you keep talking like it's all something they can clip their fingers and do I, it. All I brought up today was a fairly banal article just supporting the First Minister's position. Well, what, what, what would you expect? A, a first term MP in Westminster to do other than support his leader. I, I mean, that's kind of, it's this idea that they're not doing their job if they're not criticizing their party. The opposite is true. I mean, can, can you imagine? I mean, look what Gove had to say in support of Dominic Cummings. Oh, yeah, I've often driven around the countryside to test my eyes. <laughs> you know, I mean, the SNP are hardly over the top when it comes to support. There's plenty of them have criticised the NEC, for instance. So, yeah, you know, and on, on that note, I forgot to mention it, mate, but somebody posited, I think it was Wings. Was it? No. I Possibly Wings, I posited that the NEC decision no, it wasn't. It was Chris McElhaney. Aye, Chris read, McElhaney, read, unconstitutional. Aye, he posited that it actually is against the standing orders of the NEC and should be set aside. It's an interesting viewpoint because if it is against the standing orders, then it has to be set aside, doesn't it? Well, it gives them their excuse that they desperately need to overturn mm -hmm. the decision. Are you talking um, about the cherry decision? The cherry decision, yeah. aye. Apart, according to Chris McElhaney, Stuart, it is against the standing orders for them to have reached that decision. Um, I think it is something to do with the way that the votes were actually cast at the meeting. Yeah, it didn't so, follow um, procedure. Aye, so it was, it was aye. <laughs> Basically, they've um, made a pig's lug of it and more of a pig's lug of it than even we thought. So it looks like it may have to be set aside, which would be... Awfully interesting. I'd imagine Angus would be um, tightening the bike clips around the bottom of his trousers if they do set that decision aside. I, I think he's going to be officially delighted if it's set aside. Officially, officially delighted, yeah. Aye. 
I think. Of course he is. <laughs> He's got to be. I, I think the problem I'd with Lady that... Mac, I'd, I'd imagine Lady Macbeth will be spitting feathers, really. Well, the, the problem with it is that it's if that is the excuse they use to drop the uh, the decision against uh, Joanna Cherry standing without having to quit as an MP, heads have to roll. Yeah, somebody has that, to be held responsible for making the cock up. At that point, the, whoever chaired that meeting, um, whoever, and in fact, the whole top table at that meeting would probably have to fall on their swords because they've made. At that point, they've made an unconstitutional decision and a well, decision that was against the rules of the party. McElhenney's kind of given them an out because he's basically said that there are four people involved in this whose job it is to ensure that decisions are constitutional. So it's been narrowed down. The whole NEC wouldn't have to go. I would imagine, no, I would imagine McDonald's it. position is really difficult. Uh, the chair. Well, uh, uh, to be honest, Norrie, his, his position should be difficult based on the Cathcart decision. Yeah. Never mind what comes back with the Joe Cherry decision as well, because the Cathcart one was unconstitutional. And frankly, it's his job to ensure mm. that every decision taken falls within the constitution of the party. It, do, it will seem to people who haven't been involved in party politics, like a very convoluted system because it's the same system that's used um, from the floor uh, for conferences where you actually, you have one proposal put forward and then it is amended or not. Mm -hmm. And that Aye. wasn't what happened here. Apparently there was three or four proposals on the table and they voted for one and that's not strictly how it should be done well i well it's not of, how it should be done i'm kind of the opinion that set both aside revisit them if they need to be i mean how difficult is it to call an nec meeting given that they're doing it through zoom half of it well they've got their excuse on the table now as i say the unfortunate thing is it looks like somebody's head's going to have to be put in a plate to justify using the excuse. Well, I say unfortunate. Maybe it's not unfortunate. Well, not a... But I don't have a dug in this fight. Aye, they've, they've taken a gamble. I think it's pretty much... As much as they will tell you it's not, it's pretty much clear to anybody looking in that they wanted to stop Joe Cherry standing in Edinburgh Central. So and they've they've gone about doing that, and they've gone about doing it in a what turns out to be an amateur fashion because they've done it and made a pig's ear of it. So at that point, if they lose their position, hell mend them. They've taken a punt and made a James of it. Where did the where did the the kite that was flown about ten thousand uh, pounds being required? That, that that was a few days before the, the we heard about that. that. Aye, that was one. That was that was one of the things that was on the table, Stuart. That they decided against introducing, but instead introduced this rule that you had to step down as an MP before you could stand as an MSP. The argument they were basing everything on was cost. So the cost of a by-election, on top of the uh, campaign to pick the candidate, was too much. So both should have been done on the day of the Holyrood election mm -hmm. to save money. So that's where the 10,000 was floated. I kind of get that, but at the end of the day... Um, so it was 10,000 to be given to the party to run the campaign. To be introducing these things quite so, on quite such a ad hoc manner, um, these are pretty major big decisions. And frankly, if you're going to introduce that, that should actually be discussed amongst the parliamentary group at Westminster as well. Because how many, who's to say how many of them were yeah. thinking of possibly standing as candidates next well, year? There is talk of six or eight of them, aren't there? Um, mm -hmm. At this point, I would like to uh, apologise to all my Labour comrades for having insinuated that the SNP were trying to copy them 
in their machinations on rule bending with the NEC. You know, uh, they've already done that publicly earlier this week anyway, on a Twitter or something. No, but I would like to apologise because the Labour Party are much more cutthroat and professional at uh, bending and twisting the rules than the SNP. They are far, they're far better at being weaseled. <laughs> Labour have, have been doing it for far longer and the whole our whole, the SNP, sorry, attempt at being weasels in a sack has been strikingly amateur compared to the stunningly professional state. That so, I, as I say, I, I apologise to all those Labour professional backstabbers. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise to all those Labour professional backstabbers. Okay, right. that one. Yeah, there's uh, been a few over the years when you think about it. Um, maybe... I didn't just, do we really want to? Were you were you not involved in the Ron Brown yeah, assassination? That's that's, I was I was kind of uh, I wouldn't say I was involved in the assassination, mate. I was the one that was meant to throw themselves in front of the daggers and failed miserably because they got oh, on yeah. the end, didn't they? All right, you were meant to protect him. Kind of, I. Oh well, uh, I think maybe we've come to the end, guys. Ron Brown. Yeah. He used to be a neighbour of mine. He nice uh, was he was a drinking After buddy that. of everybody, was he not? Uh, well, he couldn't really drink me. Three half pints and Ron was bluttered. Oh right, maybe I just but maybe uh, that was what made me think he was everybody's. Did he not drink? Just, what, did he not drink in Swannies? Was he drank anywhere and everywhere, mate? It used to be the. It's just him in the port occasionally. Aye, uh, but he, he used to stay up Ferry Road, so he used to drink the spears, and then when we were doing in Leith, it was the. What do you make on the corner? The Spey, because it was the closest one to the Labour Party rooms at the time. Oh, right enough, aye. aye. And I, just on a cheery note, before we disappear, <laughs> I'd like to say to all, all our, our massed listening and viewer groups, it could be worse. Today, you could be a Spanish monarchist. Take a look at Sky and all again. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, ex king found with hand in till. <laughs> Aye, and <laughs> ex king also found with hand in knickers of women who's not his wife. Ah, uh, but I think that was fairly well known. Is that not kind of standard for the monarchy? Yeah, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't get you the sack for anything these days, does it? Not even a Catholic priest. But I, I, when, you I, have to run, when you have to run away to the Dominican Republic because you're about to get done for being an absolute pockle merchant by the Spanish government. It's a bit of a worry when you're an ex-king of Spain. I, I do like that I'm not running away, I'm trying to save the monarchy excuse. That was quite right. good. I'll tell you what, mate. I'd, <laughs> I'd love to go to Madrid now and listen to the sound of Ferdinand and Isabella Berlin in their big marble tombs. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the racket? <laughs> uh, I, another nail in the Spanish coffin. Uh, without any help from the Catalonians. Yes. Well done. Um, we'll call it a day at that. Thanks, Stuart Lockhead. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jimmy Hutton. Um, and I'm Norrie Stewart, and we'll see you all tomorrow, Wednesday. PMQs? No. Oh, no, no it's holiday don't. time, isn't it? Oh, they're not holiday, back till yeah. October or something. That's right, uh, till the schools go back. After. I'm not okay. quite sure. When, when does Hollywood go back? Will they go back next week when the kids go back to school? That's a very good question. I we'll need to look out. They tend to follow quite close to turn times at Hollywood, don't they? Aye, I think so. Normally they do, yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, call it a day that. Thanks for listening, folks, and watching, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Cheers for now. <laughs>